Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. I hope you had a wonderful day yesterday with whomever you were with. We had a glorious Christmas Eve services here, didn't we, last Friday uh, evening. We're so thankful for that. Uh, one announcement, we will not be having our regular 6 p.m. evening service this morning, uh, so you can continue to rest this afternoon. And finally, before we enter into worship, with a heavy heart, I note the passing of Mrs. Martha Akins after last Lord's Day. I want to give you a couple of details. Uh, tonight at Turner Funeral Home in Decatur, there will be a visitation and a viewing from 7 to 9 p.m., and then tomorrow morning, there will be a viewing and visitation from 10 o'clock to 1045, followed by an 11 o'clock memorial service. So tonight, Turner Funeral Home from 7 to 9 p.m. Tomorrow morning, 10 p.m. to 1045 with a service at 11 a.m. What a fitting verse for us to meditate upon from Hebrews chapter 13 as we prepare our hearts to worship the true and ever-living God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our call to worship this morning is from Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let us pray. Gracious God in heaven, we come to you this morning as your children, united by faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit to the once crucified, risen, ascended, and reigning Son. As the divine Son, Jesus is the radiance of your glory. He is the exact imprint of your nature. And as the perfect man, he is our final sacrifice and our glorified redeemer. Father, we praise you that as this year comes to a close, we are still united to this Christ. We're still members of his kingdom, still recipients of your loving kindness, still heirs of the glory of heaven. Oh, Father, would you help us to evidence his endless reign in our worship this morning. Help us to see him high and lifted up, increase our longing to be with him bodily, even as you, through him, meet with us in the Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as the years go by, this truth will never change. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand and sing the first four verses of hymn 217, All My Heart This Night Rejoices. seated. Let us go to our great God and confess our sins. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy of our praise. You are our rock and our salvation. We thank you for Jesus Christ that he died to pay the price of our sins and rose again so that sin and death is defeated forever in the lives of all who trust and believe in him. Yet we have come to see that our lives fall far short of your glory. Christ has loved us with infinite love, yet we fail to love him with all our heart. 
We confess we love the world more than love Jesus. The scripture calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Yet we know we follow our own sinful desires and passions and pleasures of the world. Too often we seek our delight and satisfaction outside of Jesus. Forgive our sins, gracious Father, in Christ's name and for his sake only. We pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to open our eyes and to see the unsurpassed preeminence of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate source of our joy and delight and satisfaction. We pray that you would help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would sanctify us through your word and spirit, guide us to give all our lives, our time, our service to Jesus, who gave his life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Having confessed our sins, now receive the word of pardons from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 48 and 49. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Amen. Now let us all stand and sing hymn number 162 of the Father's Love Begotten.
Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your love and grace toward your people. Thank you that Christ, the everlasting Son of God, the creator of the universe, came as a man to live a perfect life, to die a sacrificial death, and raised from the dead for our salvation. We thank you that our risen Christ, who has gone into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, reigning this world through his power and authority until he has put all his enemies under his feet. As extension of our gratitude, we now give our tithe and offerings. Please use them for your kingdom and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. by standing and singing the doxology. Would you pray again with me? Our Father in heaven, you have commanded us in your word to pray always with all prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You have admonished us to watch with perseverance for all the saints. You've told us to keep on praying and in everything to make our desires known to you. Therefore, our Father, we pray that you would refresh us with your presence that we might keep on praying. Remind us that you have made all things, that you give life and breath to every living thing, and that when we plunged ourselves into sin and misery, you sent forth a Savior, and you have called us into union with him who has lifted us out of the curse of the law and brought us into an eternal inheritance of glory and of joy. United to Christ, we have no one to fear, no one to impress, no one to worship but you. So, Second Father, we pray 
that such an infinitely glorious Savior would save the lost among us. We pray for family members who are far from you. We pray for friends whom we love and yet do not know you. We thank you by the all-sufficient word by which we are being saved and sanctified. You are revealing your glory. We pray for diligence to love the covenant children in our church, to set an example for them of fighting against sin and holding fast to what is good. And while we commit all of our covenant children to you, we pray especially today for Abby Rose and Adelaide Elder, for Elizabeth and Grace Elder, for their growth in grace and in the truth as it is in Jesus. Lord, we pray too for those who are suffering. We think especially of those who have lost loved ones this year. Sue Jakes, Walter Sandell, Bob Gardner, Chet Lilly, Eldon and Jareen Toll, John Hunt, Annie Swin, Regina Kreiner, Doris Boggs, Ronnie Brown, Mitch Everett, the Jarretts and the Fullers. And O oh, Father, we pray for your special comfort for Charlie Akins, whose wife Martha, mother to William and his siblings, entered into glory this past week. We thank you for her life of faith and joy in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way Charlie and William so faithfully served her to the very end. And we pray that her life and their witness would make all of us the more diligent to love one another earnestly in Christ-like ways. We pray for those facing other trials. We pray for Kim Elder as she prepares for surgery on Tuesday. We, we pray that you would give her complete healing from these aneurysms. Give her your peace and your rest. We pray for Linda Estill and Janet Fortenberry, for Eleanor Hallman, Bethany Sanders, and Jonathan Jakes. Oh Lord, we lift up everyone who is fighting to walk by faith and not by sight, and we praise you that Christ is a sure and steady anchor for our faith. We praise you for the good news that Patty Messner's scans came back last week with no signs of cancer. How merciful you are. In all of our trials and in all of our triumphs, Lord, you are good and merciful and strong to save. Finally, Father, we know we have much for which to rejoice. New life, new grace, new hope. In you, O oh God, we put our trust. Let us never be ashamed. Let us never be embarrassed for trusting in you. Our souls wait on you. Our salvation comes from you. You only are our rock and our salvation. So, Lord, would you bless us as we hear your word preached, and would you open our eyes of faith to the infinite glory of Christ our Savior. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Let us continue our worship now by standing and singing the Gloria Patri. Amen. I ask that you would remain standing as you're able for the reading of our sermon text this morning. This morning I'll be focusing on the, the last sermon in this Christmas series on uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, and we'll be focusing on verses 10 through 14. But as we tie this series together, listen now as I read the entirety of the first chapter. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, listen as I read, for this is the very word of God. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, 
and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of His Word, and you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of Your Spirit, working in and through Your Word, You might open our eyes to see and behold in new and fresh ways the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ the glories of his person, the glories of his work, and that we might receive and rest upon him alone as he is offered in the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that each and every one of you, along with Carlton, I hope that you had a very Merry Christmas. I can tell you that for the Messner family, this this week had some delightful moments. Uh, For starters, it was and is, at least for another week or so, great to have the entire family together under one roof. And as Carlton mentioned, I would add a hearty agreement and amen. The Christmas Eve services at Westminster this past week were wonderful. Also, as Carlton prayed, my mother got wonderful news this week. No sign of her cancer. Praise the Lord for his healing mercy. And to top it all off, Christmas Day at our home was peaceful and full of joy. In many ways, it was a great week. And at the same time, this week also had some some sad moments for our family. And for me, even with the, the holiday joy of the week, there's been a little note of melancholy playing in the background of my heart and mind. At the beginning of the week, we had to say goodbye to Annie, our dog of almost 15 years. Having to put Annie down was a truly heartbreaking experience for the entire family, and it brought a great sadness. And for me, it was, it was sad for a couple of reasons. One, Annie was a great dog. Fun, affectionate, loyal to our family over the years. She was a genuine gift of the Lord. And it was hard to say goodbye. But even beyond that, at least in my own heart, there is a sadness because uh, in many ways Annie represented an, an era in our family. You might call it the era of raising young children. A lot has happened in our home over the last 15 years. Babies were born. Diapers were changed. Stories were read again and again. Ball games were played. And along the way, through sweat and blood and tears and laughter and prayer, little boys have become young men. A little girl has become a young woman. And though we are still a a very busy and active household with lots of running to and fro and many childhood activities still before us, Annie's passing makes me feel in some ways like the end of an era has come. Kids are growing up. I'm growing older. I feel it more each day. 
time is marching on, and I can feel it passing. And though it is certainly exciting to think of what lies before my children and what lies before our family in the next 15 years, it also feels like something very precious is slipping away, something that has been wonderful, something that I really want to hold on to and keep, but I know you can't hold on to it, for time marches on. Things don't stay the same. And the glorious things of this life, they don't last. Now, if you know me, you know that I'm normally a glasses half full kind of guy. I'm generally inclined to a positive, hopeful outlook on the future. But every now and then, the Lord has used some moment, some experience to give me a profound sense of the fleeting nature of life. We are born. We live. We die. The relationships that we treasure, the relationships that form the very fabric of this life, they will cease. The things we have built and worked for, they will pass away. And on a couple of occasions, at moments that I I could not have predicted, and for reasons I don't fully understand in terms of why these moments and not others, right? I have felt what the writer of Ecclesiastes calls the vanity of this life. And in those moments, as your pastor, I say, I, I have felt an acute despair an almost unfathomable sadness, which has driven me to cry out to the Lord, Lord, if this life is all there is, if it all passes away and it ends in death, then this life is unspeakably bitter. Bitter because it does not and it cannot last. It all ends. And the horror is, the the better it is, the, the more joy we taste, the more love we experience, the more painful the end is. For heartache in, in, inevitably comes with the passing of time. And the loss is great. So great that I have felt on those few occasions that if this life is all there is, I cannot bear living it. To invest so deeply in this life only to lose everything in the end, it's terrible. And this week, this Christmas holiday, I, I felt some of that sadness. Some of that desperate cry. It wasn't just about a dog. It was the profound reminder that uh, in life under the sun, when it comes to life under the sun, nothing lasts forever. And in that sadness, this week, I began to prepare for my sermon on Hebrews 1, 10 through 14. What a gift. So thankful for this text. And I stand before you this morning at the close of the Christmas season, at the close of this Christmas sermon series, and I tell you, there is hope. There is hope in the sadness, hope in the despair, hope in the passing of time, hope in the face of death itself. There is hope because there is one who remains. There is one who triumphs. And by grace through faith, we will remain and triumph with him forever. So with these things in mind, let's turn our attention then one last time to Hebrews 1. Now I remind you of the argument that the author of Hebrews has been making here in this opening chapter. The author of Hebrews is, has been arguing that Jesus is superior to all other religious figures, and therefore he is worthy of our worship and devotion. He began the letter by arguing that Jesus is the superior and ultimate prophet, the superior and ultimate priest, and the superior and ultimate king. He's superior in his person, 
For as the text says, he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he is superior in his works. For he has created the world, and he actively sustains the universe by the word of his power, and he has accomplished ultimate salvation by making purification for sins. And because of this, the author of Hebrews argues, Jesus is not only superior to the prophets and priests and kings of the Old Testament, but he is even superior to the angels. The author of Hebrews acknowledges, we see it even in these verses, the angels are great. They are, as he says, winds of God, ministerial flames of fire, ministering spirits sent out by God in order to serve God for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. As we've seen in previous weeks, the the angelic hosts are awesome, truly awesome. And yet, even so, Hebrews argues, they pale in comparison to the sun. In fact, the angels in all of their glory worship the sun, S-O-N. The angelic hosts worship Jesus and serve him. And so then, with all these things in mind, we turn our attention to verses 10 through 14, and we get a few more insights into the glory and the superiority of the sun. And as we'll see, this glory, this superiority, it is good news to us here, now, and forever. So the first element of superiority, which we find in these verses, we find in verse 10, is that the Son is the creator of heaven and earth. The text says, in contrast to the angels, but of the Son, he says, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Now, this is not the first time Hebrews has proclaimed the Son to be the creator. Back in verse 2, we read that, that through the Son, God created the world. But the claim here in verse 10 is even more direct. The author quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, in which, if you flick back and read that psalm, you see that the psalmist is speaking directly to God. The previous verse, verse 24, to the ones that are quoted says, O my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all generation. And then the quote picks up. Of old, from the beginning, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. Psalm 102 is doing in a very clear way what the entirety of the scriptures do. Hail God and God alone as the creator of the heavens and the earth. As most of you will know, the Bible begins on this note, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or, Or consider a passage like Psalm 19, which echoes the language found here. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Now, there can be no mistake. The Bible speaks with one voice, God is the creator. And yet, what the author of Hebrews does here in this passage, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in a way that is unmistakable, is he takes that praise, that adoration, that prayer, which is rightly directed to God alone, and says that language is speaking of the Son. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews declares that the Holy Spirit-inspired Old Testament passage, Psalm 102, which is the very Word of God, in which God the Father is speaking to us, he says here, no uncertain terms, the Father in that passage is speaking about his Son and declaring to us that it is the Son of God who has laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of his hand. See, the Son is not just an instrument of God, not just a servant of God, not even the most glorious servant of God. No, the Son of God is God. He is the very God who created the world in Genesis 1-1. The stars proclaim the handiwork of the Son. As John Calvin says in his commentary on this passage, doubtless, In vain we shall seek to find this God, 
through whom the whole world has united in one faith and worship of God, we will in vain seek to find this God except in Christ. For he, that is Christ, is the eternal God, the creator of the heaven and the earth. Perpetuity belongs to him without any change by which his majesty is raised to the highest elevation, and he himself is removed from the rank of all created things. Now, this is no ordinary prophet, priest, or king. This is not even just the greatest prophet, priest, or king. This is no mere angelic host. This is the one who is far above all rule and authority, who is exalted above every name that can be named. This is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, Hail, hail, the Word made flesh, the babe, the Son of Mary. This Jesus is superior to all, because He is the God who created all things. And this, then, is the first aspect of the Son's superiority as we find it in this passage. The next thing, then, that we see is that the superiority of the Son as Creator is set against, contrasted with the fleeting nature of creation itself. In the past verses, the Son has been contrasted with earthly prophets and priests and kings. He has been contrasted and continues to be contrasted with the heavenly host. But here in verses 11 and 12, he is contrasted with the creation itself. The first aspect of this contrast is the author of Hebrews reveals from the scriptures the fleeting nature of creation. What we see here is that even the greatest aspects of creation, those elements of creation that would seem to be most permanent, most timeless, most enduring, they will end. They will pass. The text is explicit. The foundations of the earth and the heavens themselves will perish. They will all wear out like a garment. The day is coming when they will be rolled up, changed, changed like a garment for something new. I find it interesting that one of the great boasts of scientific naturalists used to be that the universe was eternal. They claimed it had always been and always would be. But now it's interesting, even the most hardened atheist tends to believe that the universe had some kind of miraculous beginning, a big bang of sorts, and that it will all come to a fiery and then a very cold and dark end. Well, the Scripture declares that the world had a definite beginning. It was created by the miraculous and powerful Word of God, and the Scripture is clear. It will also come to a definite end. It will perish. It will wear out. It will be rolled up and changed. And if this is true, even of the most permanent, timeless, and seemingly enduring aspects of the created order, how much more does this apply to Everything that happens, everything that exists on that foundation, under those heavens. Brothers and sisters, it all perishes. It all wears out. Rocks and trees and skies and seas, nations, empires, institutions, communities, families, individual lives. It all perishes. It all wears out. It all gets rolled up eventually. And one of the great tragedies of this life is that so many people fail to recognize this fundamental point. Many of us, we live like, like we're going to live forever, you know, like, like we'll be forever 21. We invest our time and treasure in things as if they are ultimate, as if they are enduring, as if they are of lasting value. We live as if death and decay will not affect us until it comes crashing in upon us in a cold wave of despair. Now, to be sure, right? Some things in this life are more lasting, more enduring, of greater value than other things. 
But make no mistake, in the end, it all perishes. It all wears out. Even the foundations of the earth and the stars of heaven will perish. How much more the obviously fleeting character and content of our individual lives. And yet, what the text says, in contrast with the fleeting character of this creation, stands the eternal persistence, perseverance, and the eternal presence of the Son of the Father. He laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of his hands. They will perish, but he will remain. Change and decay in all around I see, but he changes not. He is the same, the text says, and his years will have no end. In fact, the text is clear. He is the one who will actively roll up creation. He is the one who will change it all like a garment. He will endure forever with no diminishment of his glory. We see here in Hebrews 1 that the book begins with the claim that the Son is eternal. He is the same through all the passing of time. His years have no end. If we had time to study the whole book, we would see at the end in the final chapter, the book declares that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We said nothing lasts forever. Well, it's not quite true. Jesus is forever. We said everything perishes, everything fades away, everything wears out. Well, not quite, because Jesus is forever. And there are two very important aspects of Christ's eternal endurance. We see them both here in Hebrews 1. One is the eternal character of his divine person. We have been saying it over these weeks. Jesus is God, the person of the Son the second person of the triune God. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. He had no beginning. He has no end. To think about the divine, eternal preexistence of the Son is awesome. And part of what we then celebrate at Christmas is that the eternal, divine person of the Son, the second person of the Godhead, He has wedded himself to a true human nature. He's taken on human flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And that flesh, in contrast to that eternal divine nature, that, that flesh was subject to change, subject to the passage of time, subject to corruption and even to death. We know this because the Scripture chronicles for us the various changes in the human life of Jesus. He went from being a baby in a manger to a young boy of 12 to a man. And we also know this because when Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself, he died. He perished. And yet he didn't stay dead. (laughs) When he rose from the grave, the scripture says that his physical body and his human nature was fundamentally transformed. As the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he was sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Sown perishable, raised imperishable. Sown corruptible, raised incorruptible. Sown mortal, raised immortal. So what this means is that Jesus Christ is not only eternal and enduring in his divine person, But through the power of his resurrection, his human nature now, his his glorified flesh is also now eternal. It will never perish, never wear out, never fade away. It will never be rolled up or discarded or replaced. He is the same. And his years as the glorified God-man will have no end. And this then makes Jesus of Nazareth superior to all. Superior to all the religious figures that come before him. Superior to anyone who would come after him. Superior to angels and arch. 
angels. And I tell you, is this not glorious? And if this were all that Hebrews 1 had to say about Jesus, it would be more than enough to glorify and worship Jesus as Lord and God. For he is the eternal one. He is supreme over all the prophets, priests, kings, and angels. But we could, we could still be left wondering, okay, the, the eternal character of Jesus is, is clearly good news for Jesus. He will remain. His years have no end. But, but what benefit does that have for me? How does the eternal character of the Son with his pre-existent divinity and his eternal glorified humanity, how does that have any benefit for me? For those of us here today who, in the words of the great carol, it came upon a midnight clear, sing, we are beneath life's crushing load, with forms bending low. We toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. No, 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 preacher, time marches on for us. Time wastes us away. Time escorts us to our deaths. It's good news for Jesus, but but we then cry out, can anyone save us from this body of death? Can anyone save us from the futility of time? Can anyone save us from the judgment that is to come? Can the eternal one somehow usher us into his eternity? Well, the answer to that question is a robust yes. The Son can save you. Jesus can save you. And we get a a picture of this in verse 13 where we read, To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Brothers and sisters, the redemptive plan of God is not to simply rest on his eternal character. Let time and death consume everything else until he alone is left. No, no, you see, God is actively at work to defeat his enemies. The Father is working to place them under Jesus' feet. So that, as Colossians 1 says, Jesus will ultimately have preeminence in everything, including a people that he has redeemed for himself. Now, the quote here in verse 13 comes from Psalm 110. Interesting note, this is the most quoted Old Testament passage, Psalm 110, in the entire New Testament. And Psalm 110 is clearly speaking of the Messiah. It's a psalm of David, and yet David clearly recognizes as he writes the psalm, he's writing about someone else. For he writes, the Lord said to my Lord... Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The one that David speaks about is his Lord. And it's clearly then a passage about the Messiah, about the eternal king. It's a passage about the child who will be born, the son who will be given, who will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God. And this one, David's son and David's Lord, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ the eternal Son of God in human flesh. And he has come to defeat the enemies of God and to rescue his people from those enemies. And so we ask, well, who are the enemies of God? Well, it's it's all who oppose God's eternal rule and reign. Now, on one level, when we think about the enemies of God, we can often think of particular people, particular nations even, very clear in the Old Testament, right? There were those individuals and groups who hated God, who rebelled against Him. We can think about passages like Psalm 2, where where the text says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Well, surely there are human enemies of God. And we see in the Scriptures, God will ultimately defeat them. They will not triumph. They will not remain in their rebellion in this life. They will perish and face the judgment of God. And yet we see very clearly in the New Testament that the Scriptures encourage us to consider the enemies of God on a a deeper and more profound level than just human enemies. 
Ephesians 6 tells us, our battles as the people of God are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, Satan and the demonic forces of evil are also great enemies of God, enemies that stand behind and animate the human enemies of God. And yet the New Testament calls us to consider the enemies of God on an even deeper level than this. Beyond human opponents and even demonic foes lies the reality of sin and death itself. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the last enemy of God and His people is death. And death, we learn, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, is the fruit, the sting of death is sin. See, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, our greatest enemy, you might say now, is the passage of time, cursed by sin, which marches us headlong and headstrong into death and judgment. Hear what the esteemed theologian Gerhardus Voss wrote on this subject. He said, time, especially time with the wasting power it acquires through sin, is the arch enemy of all human achievement. It kills the root of joy, which otherwise belongs to working and building. All things which the succeeding generations of mankind have wrought in the course of the ages succumb to its attacks. The tragic sense of this accompanies the race at every step of its march through history. It is like a pall cast over the face of the peoples. What I spoke about at the beginning of this sermon, that this is the futility, the vanity of life, that because of sin, life is always marching toward death. You can try to distract yourself from this reality for a time, but you cannot escape it. Reality will come crashing in upon you at some point, and you will find yourself under the the crushing load of sin with the the passage of time and death and judgment bearing heavy upon you. And so we ask then, so how does Jesus, the eternal Son of God, save us from these great enemies? First, he's joined his eternal divine person to a true human nature. And in that perfect, obedient, and holy human nature, he bore the full weight of our sin. He suffered and died for our sin in our place. He he bore the full penalty of sin. He bore the futility of time with the wasting power it acquires from sin. He bore death itself, which is the fruition of that futility, and he bore the very judgment of God the Father, which is the ultimate sting and consequence of sin. You see, the eternal Son was wedded, joined, united to a real human nature so that the foes of human nature might be defeated in his humanity, defeated through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And I tell you, Jesus Christ has fully defeated those foes. He has defeated sin and death and the devil so that these enemies now have no claim on him. Even in his humanity, they have no power over him. And yet here is the glorious promise of the gospel. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says we're spiritually united to him, united to his immortal, imperishable, incorruptible humanity so that our humanity is actually conformed to his likeness. So that in union with Christ, the enemies of God, sin, death, the devil, they have no claim, they have no ultimate power over us. Now it's true. As Christians, we still bear the weight of the wasting power of time and the curse of death on our outer nature. The Bible doesn't mince words on this. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that even as Christians, our outer nature is wasting away day by day. Time still marches on. 
death still comes. We still face the pain of searing loss in this life. However, make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the victory that the eternal one has secured over the enemies of God is complete. It's total. Jesus, the eternal one, now sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning until the day when the enemies of God are utterly and finally made a footstool for his feet. The day is coming when the enemies of sin and the wasting effects of time and death itself they will all be swallowed up. They'll be crushed forever. No more to afflict the people of God. Until that time, our outer nature is wasting away. The passage of time causes grief to come upon us. We still bury loved ones. We are still cut off from the relationships we find so precious. But the scripture is clear. Even as this outer nature is wasting away, the inner nature, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, it's being renewed day by day. And this slight momentary affliction, which... I think Paul's referring to the whole of life under the sun. This slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The day is coming when the whole of our being, body, mind, and soul, will be fully conformed to the eternal humanity of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And we will live in eternal fellowship with the eternal Son, and through the Son, we will have eternal fellowship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus alone is superior. The superior prophet, priest, and king. He's accomplished a superior salvation because he is the eternal, superior, and glorious God. He laid the foundation for the world in the beginning. He will remain. His years have no end. He has defeated the enemies of God on our behalf so that through faith in Him and Him alone, we can know, we can know that in union with Christ, we will be changed. In glorified perfection, we will then remain and our years will have no end. Until then, brothers and sisters, we we endure. We persevere in faith, knowing that the eternal one, the victorious one, he is faithful, able to save us, and able to enable us to endure with him forever. As we close our time together, I I leave you with just some further words from Psalm 102. I wish we had time to study the whole psalm, right? But in some ways, what's going on in Psalm 102 is just a microcosm of everything we've talked about here this morning. Psalm begins with the desperate recognition of the fleeting nature of life with phrases like, my days pass away like smoke. My heart is struck down like grass that has withered. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But then there's a turn. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Your years endure throughout all generations. And in the quote of of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away, but you are the same and your years have no end. And then the psalm concludes by saying, the children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is our hope this Christmas season, that the eternal one has given eternal salvation to all who believe. Glory to God in the highest. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you'd give us sight to see the spiritual realities of eternity. 
Oh, Lord, we get so bogged down with the, the burdens of this life. We want to be able to face them in truth, not to escape from them, but to face them in truth, but to do it with the hope of eternal life in Christ. Help us to lay hold of that truth, to treasure it, to live by it, to, to live by faith in the glorious Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us the strength to endure until the day that we see Jesus face to face. And even so, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, let's conclude our time together by singing the final three verses of hymn 217. The final three verses, all my heart this night rejoices. Let's stand and sing. encourage you immediately after the benediction as you are able to be seated for a few moments to consider the greatness of our God and some of the themes of our worship as the organ postlude is played. But now receive the benediction of our God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.